So what do we have learned so far is we're trying to quantize, it, quantize the rock theory. And we'll just write down the Lagrangian. OK, I keep emphasizing that you don't need to remember much. But since I've been talking about this Lagrangian for five lectures, so please remember Dirac Lagrange. OK, if you mess up with the sign, I think that's a convention. But the i is important, and the gamma is important, partial, the, the rest is fine. <laughs> the only thing I don't care much about is, is that sign. Okay, so what we have done so far is basically to motivate, we spend a long time motivate this Lagrange, spend a long time to try to show that this Lagrangian is defined to this, de define a spin one half spinner that is a fermion. And then, then we just move to colonization and says that we propose anti motivated by which means I have to write here too. And the dirt RS, which is the spin label. Okay, from now on, I'll follow some other references, call this spin label polarizations. It's just a name. It's like followed from the photon theory. It's the reason I'll do that is because I've been hiding these spinner indices for a long time. But from this lecture onward, sometimes it's good to, to keep them around. So that's the only reason I do that. So these are called the polarization, there's spin label, and uh, that's the anti-commutation relationship we impose. We argue that we have to impose an anti-commutator relationship. Otherwise, we have the infinite negative energy problem, which is not good. OK, after that, ah, here comes my favorite part of my last lecture, is how did I manage to spend five minutes to do a calculation that it does not need to be done. OK. By this condition, you can immediately, okay, well, how we argue about the causality is that we only care about if op, op, operator that can be observer, observable, they commute or not. And then, because it's a bilinear thing, we emphasize that all the fermion thing that is Lorentz environment all look like bilinear. Then there's some gamma things in the middle. This is just combination of gamma matrices, has some various choices that we see. That we realize in order to have a causality, this basically says gives us some anti commutator should vanish. So this requiring the observable commute. Communi Commute means that we require some anti commutator to be zero. Sorry, one question. Uh, yep. Uh, what what are the two sets of indices on each on each of the size? Which size? In the anti commutator second line. Ah, you are questioning my clarity of right. This is very good. <laughs> Let me do it again. No, no, so no, there no. is psi. No, no, it's important. It's important. The only reason that I only do it for now is because today it become important. Before I was like, oh, they are all dummy indices, they all get summed over, they are fine. But uh, today we're gonna talk about a formula that many of you write in your homework. That's why, and in those, they are no longer summed over, so they become important. I don't know if my choice of color is right, please let me know. That's why from today onward, I'll be careful and keep track of them. <clears throat> yeah. So my question, what do they mean? I mean, one is the spin index, and yes. the other one is 
a polarization. No, you are right. They don't have polarization. Okay, I'm being so yes. Thank you very much. They don't have polarization because the okay, you are very right. There is no polarization in those guys because I could just write down the what's that called mode expansion, and they are polarization is summed over in Psi. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'll be try to be smart today by separating them into the creation operator part and the annihilation operator part. So it's just two things add together. I want to separate them so I don't write a huge line and another huge line and the one I to the commentator I've used like the interval. Also you've seen this before in Bosani theory. Okay, so so then I should have plus here and I should have a C S dagger D P P S. Okay, if it's repeated, I still assume they are summed over. And now the index A should be here. Oh, you have too many index. So I guess randomly I decided this index A to be spinner index is green color. Isn't it on the feet? Huh? Isn't it on the feet? Haha, <laughs> thank you very much. All right, apparently I'm not functioning. <laughs> so please catch me. I'll try to talk slower so you have time to catch me. Excellent. So this is the plus guy. And then there is a minus guy. And the minus guy should be the same, but I swept the B. For you, and then this is that. Right? Well, I guess now you know why I refused to keep track of them before because obviously I can't. Yes. Do we uh, assume that there's an implicit sum over S? On yes. The yes, I'm still making that assumption. If you say a pair of things, they say still sum. So uh, should we have a dagger on one of the sides? In the Excellent. I did forget some daggers. No. Nope. In the anti-commutation relation. Oh, yeah. Where did that go? Thank you. All right. OK, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> but uh, I have no choice, because later we'll have to use it. So let's write down the barred guy. I'll use a B index for no reason, just because maybe later it's important. And it depends on X. Huh. To be consistent, I should all write to the Heisenberg order. So this is obvious a four vector, so this is the Heisenberg thing. All right, let's bar this thing. So if I dagger this, this one would become the plus guy. And then I'll just copy the thing I have right now. And then I'll have a U bar. I'll just write the thing and you guys can tell me if I'm making further mistakes. All oh, right, this guy's as ours. Oh, no, no. 
So there's nothing magical I took on. I just dagger it and multiply by gamma zero. And that's what I get. In case I'm missing something up there. Okay. So this is what we have done so far is we quantize the Dirac equation, we find some Heisenberg picture field operators, we argued the causality is okay. And uh, now, yeah, am I right about the index? <laughs> It seems okay. Well, we are going to use it, so eventually the, the, the mistake will pop out. As you guys realize doing the homework, you feel like, hmm, I have a minus. I was expecting a plus. Or the other way around. Okay, let's leave it there. Today, we're going to finally do interactions. Yay! We were so close to our final goal of QFT1 which is talking about a real interaction that exists in the real world, which is very well tested. Okay, after I go to the public talk, I realize it might be slightly less tested by, than the pulsar spirits or whatever. So David was right. That is the most uh, precision test before gravitational wave. But this is very close. One of the tests go, to, go to 10 to the minus 11, so 11 digits after the zero thing. Okay, so interaction. Our goal is we have been very theoretical so far, but eventually as a physicist, I'm sorry for the people who are very into mathematics, but as a physicist we want to talk to our experimental friends and they are smashing things together and we want to ask what they want. So as you have seen before, what do they want in the collider? Huh? What do they want? <laughs> what do they want from us? Cross okay. section. Excellent. See, we're going through dance recipe again. So dance recipe says we want a cross section. What's the next step? So don't go too fast. What's the next step? So how could we get a cross section? I'm an Huh? Matrix element. Matrix element, we do some phase space integral that, uh, well, I don't care because you have already done, I know you can do it, but we want matrix, actually, we want matrix element square. This become important because there are a few tricks that I want to show you in the last lecture how to get from <laughs> matrix element to matrix element square. I have tried to avoid doing too many matrix, gamma matrix calculations. But between here, there are some, some gamma things. Okay, very good. We want a matrix element. Keep going. If we want a matrix, what is that matrix element? Okay, this is a silly question. I'll write that. So this is what we define to be matrix element. So maybe there is a modular momentum conservation, but it's proportional to that. So how do we get this? What's the next step in dance recipe? LSD. LSD. So, okay, it's Monday. So I decided to amuse you. You might not be amused. But when I first thought about LSD reduction formula, I thought what it does is this. <laughs> So look, this is LSD, and then this is the reduced version. <laughs> so apparently it doesn't do that. <laughs> but anyway, so, but LSD, okay, it's very good. Along the arrow, <laughs> become LSD. But let's expand this LS0. There is also another recipe, like a recipe within recipes. So in this recipe, what do we do? Yeah? But if, if you just look at this thing, look at this thing. 
What's the important question to ask about this thing? What is S? Well, that's actually less important than the other thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> because that's what we're going to go compute. This whole thing is going to tell us what is S. So since we already answered that question, okay. so the other two become important at the first step. So what we actually want to ask is what is this and what is this, right? And then, if you remember from the Bosonic case, then write something like this happens at the infinite pass, and this happened in the infinite future. Right? So what's the next obvious thing to do? Now I have two states. And I want to find the inner product of them. Just find it. <laughs> just plug in whatever I just wrote down to whatever is above. Yeah? I hope this doesn't surprise you. If it does, please let me know. Because there might be a quicker way to do it. But for me, I'll say I have two definitions, and then I have a third definition contains the previous two definitions, I can just plug it in. Okay? I just flip this guy and then sandwich it with that guy. Okay. Didn't lose any daggers, but for me. Right? What's the next step? In this recipe. Plug in the identity we proved. Huh? Plug in the identity we proved. Plug in the identity you proved. Oh, you're going. Two steps too far. <laughs> you are uh, three steps ahead of us. Okay, so I'm trying to this. This uh, now we're gonna do something cute. It's called uh, say t squared. So t is the time ordering is equals t. It says if you you already time order, I can just time order you again because you are already time ordered. <laughs> yeah. So this. Trick allows us, apparently I have no idea about the concept of color chalk before, to add a, a T operator. No, nope, doesn't look like good color. Hmm. Yeah? Fun fact, if you already ordered and you want to do the same ordering again, you can just keep doing it, but nothing is going to happen. Then, then there is this awesome trick. It's brilliant. It's called if you add the same thing and subtract it away, I'll do it, I'll subtract the same thing and add it back, they are not going to change my result. Am I? And then, this is called some integral. It's just a integral. As you have all seen, this integral is defined by de doing the derivative of things I know, and then put it back. I mean, th this is brilliant. I mean, when is the last time you face a scenario, you know exactly how this operator or function depend on time at all time. And then you suddenly decided that I'm going to do a derivative and then integrate it back. <laughs> it's a brilliant thing to do. And uh, then the next step, of course, now we define the three things. Four things, we'll just get this back in, and where the time ordering comes into play says everything drops out. The only thing we care become just the integrals. And then, 
then, now we come back to Sarah's step. Says that we, we know how to calculate this integral, this integral for bosonic theory. It looks like this. And uh, the, the, this front thing, it doesn't quite matter because what calculating a 2 to 2 scattering, so they are all going to cancel. You should remember it contains a integral, and uh, then it's something will give momentum conservation, or for momentum conservation. And then we get a klein gordon operator because it's a field that satisfies the klein gordon equation. So that's what I mean. In interview, you don't have to remember the formula. You can just write down the word line, not the top line. Of course, I will ask what's klein gordon operator? You kind of should know that because you spend quite a long time studying. But you know, like details, minus sign, plus sign, who cares? In the interview room. If you're actually doing the calculation, you, you, you do care those plus, minus signs. Okay, so let me, with the exception of some minus signs that are particularly important in Fermel, and we will see it in tomorrow's, there's a collection of minus signs we have to be paying attention. Because the fermionic thing, like, <laughs> It's because from fermions are different from bosons, some minus pop up. And those are the ones you want to pay attention. If it's the same with the bosonic case, okay, who cares? And uh, okay, now we have integral. Now I can finally write down the LSC reduction formula if I could find a board that long. But I'll try to write it like this. So the LSC says we have a bunch of klein gordon operator and uh, plane and the plane waves over here. So which is the integrals I just write down. So it's a bunch of the things like this. But what's interesting to us is what we get out of which is phi, four, five, three, phi, one, dagger, no, there's no dagger, phi, two, x, yeah? I'm not gonna write this. This just look like this, except that there are four of them. I have to keep track which of them are plus, minus, okay? The, the, the key point of L is the reduction formula says, you're calculating a scattering process, but the idea is as long as you know how to calculate the time-ordered operator's expectation value, you're fine. Yeah? And now, where we are, we have LSD. We have time ordered uh, things. I can keep this order. I don't have to because I could be in general somehow interested in this. So now I have this. Yes, question. So right now, are we still reviewing the bosonic case? Yes, okay. we are still reviewing the bosonic case. It took you, I don't know, three lectures to go through this. So it will take me some what time to review. And we're going to do exactly the same thing again, except that we put a spin on it in dance sports. <laughs> so, so I do want to continue review. But, but the rest, are, th that is the longest thing to do. The rest becomes simple because, do we know what's, what part of this make us need some smart ways of Calculate. It's because this omega thing called the interacting vacuum. 
who knows what is interacting vacuum? So then there is a very smart guy called a Dyson. Well, Dyson is really smart. He says, well, I can do it. You can go to the interacting picture, and, and then that's what you have already done in a bosonic case. And the upshot is if you go to the interaction picture, what you can do is that uh, change the omega, which we have no idea what it is, to this thing. So this is the interacting Lagrangian Leibovitz. Yeah. And then the next step is I have e to the i interaction action. What should I do? Expand. Here, yeah. perturbation. Then we realize the only thing I need to figure out how to do is. A bunch of things is this thing. As long as I know how to calculate this, no matter how many phi's are in the middle, I'm all set. Yeah? So here's another thing is important is that so there is another smart guy says that then we call it a weak contraction. Basically, what it says is that we want to calculate. Let's define weak contraction this way. So basically, he wants to calculate the difference between time ordering and normal order. Because he realized, hey, if they are all normal order, I have a vacuum on the right. So everything will just go. Then he did that, and they call them, well, weak contraction. So the, what, they, what did that, that bring us to is that uh, some time ordered uh, guys is just equals to the normal ordered guys plus all possible contractions. And then they say, well, we should really do it for the easiest case when I have only two things and they contract to each other, we get the Feynman problem. And this is just stand for a long expression. And this is something you can just ooh, go all the way back and find a cross section of it. A long story, isn't it? OK. So now the reason why I want to do this is that at the matrix element, you guys are just directly like jump to this LST reduction formula. But there is a different rule. It's a simple rule. Is you know. Somebody will hand you something called a Feynman rules, and they can just sit and start calculating. But I'm a very suspicious person. It's like I order something like a do-it-yourself from IKEA, supposed to turn into a table, but I follow the instructions and I always end up with two nails, or something like that. I think a Feynman is probably more reputable than IKEA, but I'm suspicious. I really want to know where the rules are coming. So that's why we're doing this. That it is that instead, I'll just write a whole board of rules says, these are the Feynman rules for fermions. Let's calculate. We'll actually try to figure out where the rules are. Also, because Dan promised, like, oh, Gong will talk about where the fermion external leg, what's more efficient. Yeah, of course. Next time, I'll switch spots. I'll just tell students, they will tell you about this. But anyway. <laughs> For, for various reasons <laughs> that apparently we're doing this.
But the good thing is you guys did the hardest part of the job. You guys did that integral. So the last two things for me to do isn't that much. But let's say, let's start from the first step. I want to calculate this. As I said, something after that we calculate on Friday. And whatever comes before, you've already known how to do. OK, where am I? I need some initial states. So let's create some. OK, we'll use a horribly concise notation. It says, this guy is defined to be the operator carrying P K1 momentum and the spin, the polarization S1. Also, it has a time dependence. Yeah, it's just like the bosonic case, except the fermion carry polarizing. So now I can just write it B1 dagger. Into dagger and the final state look the same except to change one, two, two, three, and four. Yeah, so far so good. Here's an aside. Is that for fermions we really have to be paying attention. If I define this the initial state. We should stick with this definition. If I swap them, I pick up a minus sign. Yeah, that's called a Fermi Dirac statistics, which is directly reflected on our anti commutator relationship. And also, if I try to create a two state, it's vanished because the anti commutator relationship, which means that poly exclusion principle is good. So in all accounts, we have evidence that the anti commutator indeed give us a firm. OK. So that's the first step. I'm done. Second step is apparently write down that result. So I was like reading, reading, because all the operators just disappeared because of this time order thing. So I don't care if it's Fermi or Boza, but there we care because you guys calculated for the fir Fermi, it's something different. So let's write that down. It's omega. I4, I3, I1 dagger, I2 dagger, X count. So that's, that's up to that point. I'm the same with the bosonic theory. And the next step is a different step. So as, I, as I've seen in the homework, people say what is B. And some people postulate and then check, oh, the answer is what exactly I expect. Excellent, excellent approach. Sometimes it's good if you, you check if you postulate what is B that is actually work, which just plug in your answers to say that uh, it gives the B. But anyway, I trust all of you have done this calculation. I'll just write down the result. So I won is b1 at plus infinity minus b1 at minus infinity, which is equals to minus i integral some i's, <coughs> and then some b1 bars. That's one, k1. And then our beautiful Iraq operator sits right here. And then that's psi x.
I think that's what you. Well, then you look at it, you're like, it's probably going to be OK, because I have my Dirac operator sits right here before when I'm calling Gordon operator sits. Sits right there, and I have my Dirac field. And where did this term come from? Why well, it has to show up, because I know this thing, if I look at this side, it has no spinner index. So the spinner index on this Psi had better go. It doesn't help. The gamma matrix, you still have a spinner index. So there must be something providing the other spinner index to be summed. And again, it has to be a bar, because we realize the Dirac conjugate is just something that gives us Lorentz invariance. And then I keep track of this polarization. And the importance is that this thing we're going to plug in this thing does carry the polarization index. Yeah? Why does the phase only involve three vectors? Like when you have the epi k dot x, why is that not? Uh... Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. This just says it's position x1. Oh. They are not eyes. Sorry, that's a dot. That's a one. That's a one. And that's, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that happened. That's, that means my, my chalk uh, moved okay. <laughs> randomly. No, no, no. That's a good question. Yeah, this uh, four vector dot, this is uh, just saying, aha, this is your question. Thank you. Very much. This psi is at x1. So it carries momentum k1. Yeah? So now it pays off for me <laughs> that you have done the calculation. I can just say this thing is, oh, no, there is one more step. Well, some of you guys actually did this step without me asking you, which is nice. Now I'll just carefully taking a dagger of this guy. This dagger is slightly tricky. I get that. I integral. I get a some minus sign. And now I have to take the dagger of this expression. Yeah? OK. It doesn't happen very often. But in this particular case, I'll actually multiply the psi in. I'm just putting this. So let's look at my first term. It gets a minus i psi mu. This thing dagger, this thing dagger, and then, okay, there is a u dagger, gamma zero there, so gamma zero dagger, and then the dagger of u dagger is u, but the, it does keep, that does So that's what I get from, Staggering this thing. Just dagger and then reverse the order. And this guy is somewhat more friendly. I get a psi dagger, gamma zero dagger, you dagger dagger is. So I get, OK, so let's first erase some daggers on the gamma 0 because it's self, it's itself. And this just gave me back psi bar mu.
So that, remember the property of gamma mu staggers, you can just use that and it cancels some gamma zero, then this gamma zero is combined with this guy to become bar. And the U is still U. Okay. They have some momentum dependence, has some polarization. There's a gamma mu here in the middle of the sidebar and you. No, oh, there is another U. Gamma mu. Gamma mu, yes. Where did my gamma mu go? Oh, it disappeared. Right. <laughs> Sorry, it literally just disappeared. That's not good. Okay, let's take the minus sign out. And I'll take the U out. Okay, at this moment, I'm so tempted to take the Psi bar out. Can I do it? Wait, this is a plus, but can I do it? I'm so tempted because they have a common Psi bar. Can I do it? People are shaking heads. No, why not? Huh? The derivative is acting on the first one. Sure, but if I pull this all the way here, it's still acting. There's a gamma mu there. There's a gamma mu there. Oh, annoying are you gamma mu. But uh, I'll false do it by pu pushing the Psi bar the other side and use this funny notation. So it's just a notation that the derivative should act in on the left. Because if it's if this silly Psi bar hiding between the gamma mu and the derivative, it's not very useful for me, right? I, I, I want to, it eventually to go to somewhere that everything in the sandwich between the vacuum state to be a time-ordered field operator. And if I can't pull it out somehow, then I defeat my purpose of doing this. But now we can, with a notion of this funny notation, says if I look at the derivative, it has a narrow on it, it just means the derivative acting on the left. Then I can combine everything, says, matrix element I'm seeking is just a bunch of uh, operators acting on Psi, Psi, Psi bar, Psi bar. Let me figure out the bars are one and two, four and three. And there are a bunch of this guys. So this guys are, again, Dirac operator. So you can check this is indeed a Dirac operator because this is the Dirac equation if you start with the Lagrangian and uh, do it on, on this. You have two independent fields. If you do it on Poseidon, you get the Psi Dirac equation, if you do it on Psi bar, you get it. Okay, so, so there is the Dirac equation 
Dirac operator here, which I'm acting onto the left. And then the very important part is it carry US1, P1, US2, P2. And on the other side, we have the one you already discovered at the beginning, which is U3, U4, what is it? Bars, oh, of course. There you have U3 bar, U4 bar, and I want to emphasize there is S4 and S3. There are two. Of course, there's the momentum dependence as U rule. And then there are some more Dirac operator, which is here, Dirac which will act on the field. And these are Dirac operator acting on the Dirac counter. Okay. So the Dirac operators on the left act on the right. So they would be like that, but with an arrow to that side. Okay. Yeah, but that's just, <laughs> yeah, but hey, you, wait, like people do it. People yeah. do it to look at metric, yeah, okay. but then I just add an error okay. if I, I need to, if I don't. It's a, if there's no error, means it's the ordinary one. But I think I should be, like, that's a smart thing to do it, like right and then left, so that you never, you always keep tracking. But that, that's basically, so the phenomenonic change of the LSC reduction formula is, of course, this integral will look very different. But this one of the difference you would immediately know, even if before your calculation is you should expect a Dirac operator, because free field, free field should still give you a zero. And then this part, you can also speculate where it comes from. It really, you need something that it needs to make this thing a Lorentz scalar and some bar thing. And if you go back to look at this cute thing, separated things, and you were like, I, if I want to extract a B, B always come with U. And I need a U bar just to make the index. So there's something you can speculate that look like this. And then the little trick is that that in order to squeeze all the fermion field in between the vacuum, where is my right vacuum? It disappeared. Okay. In, in order to squeeze everything between the vacuum, I need to define this funny, funny derivative such that I can pull everything out. But the, the most important lesson is that we have these guys. And I believe in bosonic case, you have one. So instead of one, we have some news, we have some U bar. And of course, use and the U bars is because I'm starting out with a calculation with the B operator, which is particle. So basically what I'm studying here is two fermions scattered to two fermions. And you can, as you can probably imagine, if you study two anti-fermions scattered to the anti-fermions, so probably the only modification will be changing use to the something like that. There might, might be a minor issue that we'll see tomorrow. Okay, five minute break. Uh, <laughs> I'm not happy with it. Us, so yeah. I mean, yeah. the right expression for creation. Yeah. Have to I hate it. Yeah. 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 How do we? Oh, well, we'll like, oh, we'll assume that's a big regression. 
Oh, the pharmacist with notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still good. Yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
because I just had this idea this weekend. That game is not trying to win. <laughs> it's, it's like a telephone. You do want the message to be passed up. <laughs> so it's just, there's two approach. One approach is I'll write down all the important QED process and write down the correspondence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's just like making this, why don't you give me a shot in that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the approach why, right? But I don't think you are enjoying that much. Me neither. I might be able to write down matrix element correctly if I really focus. <laughs> but um, no, it's pointless. So it's better for you guys. And, uh, the, 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 and the, the thing is that the game is very self-checkable. When you get back your pet, and you're like, I ran down electron positron. The, the last person who guessed my process is a completely different process. So it, it's, it, I like that game. Well, we could have played that game like for real. And because I'm horrible at drawing and very creative at interpreting. <laughs> Play it with me, you will never take a win, but it could be entertaining. <laughs> Okay, so as we see, okay, very good. Two important errors were pointed out. Oh, sorry, it's I did do it once and I did it again. <laughs> but anyway, so there are two very important errors was pointed out. First of all, I talk about the time ordering all the time and I forgot it. And then there is also, it's pointed out, this has to be pulled all the way to the end because the part of the derivative isn't acting on this guy who contains x dependence. And the re reason I can do this is because this thing is not a spinner, doesn't carry any sort of a varisome index. It's really just a number. Just pull it to the end. And then, of course, it was pointed out that where do your integral and whatever go, well, they, as I said, that uh, you don't want to watch me to write down the full LSZ reduction formula for fermion on the board. So that's why there are just things says, just remember this very in important guys you'll find. And then there's this important guys we find today. You just put to the ones to the right on the side and to the left on the side. I want to point the important part. Okay, there's other important part that I really should emphasize that I forgot. But let's see. Is that remember I was like repeated the index is a still sum. And that these things are all Lorentz scalars because their spinner indices are summed over. But now this pull, pushing and pulling make them actually, we should write it out because the next step, next step that they will be separated because I will say, destroy all these operators. I only want to look at the whatever is in the middle. So when we're looking at in the middle, they actually carry spinner index. We, only, we were only looking at one particular component of the Psi. Yeah? That's an important thing I want to emphasize, which means continue what we have before. What we want to do, well, now it doesn't matter if I keep four of them because now, you, now we realize what we want to do. We want to do is time order a bunch of fermions. And the next step, I'll just say, where did the next? The next step is this step. This step says going to the interacting picture. We realize that uh, we can do this, time, this thing. And then we can get rid of the interacting Vacuum instead of calculated the normal vacuum, except now we have infinite terms. Yeah? But then there's nothing from, from your dynamic about it. You can do exactly the same step. It will exactly carry through. If I've given you an interaction term, which I haven't, that 
that it would follow through. So that's the third step. We didn't do anything. We carry on. And the next step says is figure out this time ordered field product acting on vacuum. And as we can see, eventually the only thing is important, which is nice. I like the physicist thing. And the, the, the induction, oh, well, most time it works, is that uh, from our past experience, it seems I only really need two. Yeah? Two seems to be good enough, and that's what we're going to do. So this will be psi at x, y, psi. At y, and they have some spinner index. And oh, no, no, no. So, this is what I want is that I only want to evaluate the two field vacuum experiment. Expectation, time order, the two field expected. Yeah. You have to put the bar one because one has a creator and the other one has an, an, an annihilator, right? Because if you right. put two bars or two on bars, you yeah. will get zero. Right? Exactly. Okay. Very good. Exactly. So basically, what I did here is pointing out the fact that the psi. But the contraction is just zero. Because no matter time order, normal order, eventually it's something related to a commutator, and the commutator of the psi with themselves, or psi bar with themselves, mm, they are zero. Okay, I just want to be consistent with myself. Is that. Uh, Okay. 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 So basically, we want this thing. And uh, well, there is, first of all, there is one issue is time ordering. Because whenever you mention this ordering things, remember the normal ordering? But it's not the same for both on the fermion. And now we encounter another ordering issue. If you are under ordering things in Ivan the Net, it may not use the same ordering. So, so remember bosonic case. Bosonic case says, oh, I know how to order stuff. If it's it will just be this. If x time is bigger than y time. And I'll swap it if it's the other way around. It's very intuitive. You put the thing that happened to the last on the left. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Of course, you don't get a minus sign because of bosons. So that's why it's intuitive. Thank you. For fermion, well, fermion as we might have seen now. So per se, I'll just grab a per se and uh, another per se bar, I guess. Let's give them index so I can freely swap. So for this thing, what do we know because it's a fermion, so they will anti-commute. We have two fermion fields, and if you want to swap them, it should pick up a minus sign. So now I can try to time order it. I can try to time order both sides. Okay, this is a silly way to do it. 
the only thing I want to do is take a time order on both sides. Suppose x zero bigger than y zero, and suppose we follow the same definition, the intuitive definition. Says that the x is bigger than y, so this guy is fine. And uh, intuitively, the other one is not fine, so I need to swap it. So, so this is the, from the bosonic definition. And they were like, huh? This probably is not going to work. How come I have two fields multiply each other and get is equals to minus it itself? If this is a true, means well, the two field multiplied together is zero. That certainly can't be true all the time. So the way to fix it is, of course, say, let's say both fermions are funny. If we want to swap them, we should pick up another plus minus sign. So let's see, try. It's good that there's only plus minus sign so that if I try one fail then try two is probably. But anyway, so the thing I want to point it out is that when I try to time order fermion, of course I can say if it's already time ordered, then this should be fine because it's already time ordered. Time order, remember, it respect this formula says it's already time ordered, then you can, if you order them again, they are still time ordered. But then we want to add this minus sign says in the case that it's not already time ordered, we should add a crucial minus sign. As you say, if we don't add that minus sign, we run into trouble or contradiction. Okay, so at this point, our expression makes sense. On the other hand, I just want to point it out. The thing we calculate, it has this vacuum expectation value. But the thing we are calculating is a propagator, which is just a number. It has no creation annihilation operator. It's like on the right vacuum, you create a particle, but it, then it's annihilated on the left. In the end, this thing is in, OK, let's say function not an operator, which means I can just get rid of the vacuum and just focusing on calculating what's t, this time ordered thing. Yeah, makes sense. Vacuum or not vacuum, doesn't matter if it's not an operator in the middle. Okay, so the next step is remember what's weak contraction. This, this interesting contraction symbol is equals to T minus normal ordering. Yeah? So now in order to get to the two-point function, we need to take a look. So now the whatever I wrote down the first board finally paid off. Say let me write. So let's try to normal order this guy. T plus a x 
to say B bar Y. Let's, of course, assume X zero bigger than Y zero, so we can do specific calculation. And you must have seen this calculation before for the bosonic case. It just meant we are going to split into the plus guys and the minus guys. This, this step should be straightforward. I'm plugging in the definition of those things. In. The, the plot, it, it, one thing can be split into two. That's all what I'm using. OK, so remember the definition is the plus guy has the creation operator. The my, this guy has the annihilation operator, which means as long as you are off order plus, you choose this to be plus, you are definitely normal order. If you choose they are both minus, they are also normal order. This is, should be something familiar to you, is that there's only one term you need to do something about, which is this term. This term has annihilation operator first, creation operator follow. That's the only problematic. Yeah, you agree? So I say, it equals some good guys plus this term, which I propose to add an anti commutator in because And this will be swap. And uh, this guy is a good too, right? Good guys. So this is the same trick. I'll add a term and then subtract term in order to swap. Instead of using commutator, we'll use anti-commutator because that's the major difference between bosonic and the fermion. So now they are all good guys. So it is basically plus the normal order in the guys plus this guy, which I guess we should have figured it out what it is later. OK, because it's fermions, we should think about what is this guy. Now it's just y is bigger, the, the y time is bigger than x time, but we argued fermions are fermion, that they come with, minus, come with minus signs all the time. And this is by definition minus, okay? Which means all this argument, I can continue to do the same thing. I could uh, split them up into parts 
And then, so this should be equals to good guys and the plus a problematic part, which is psi b minus y, psi a x, and this minus sign gets to inherit. Yeah? Are you following me? The only thing happens is that the time ordering introduce a minus sign. And I, I'm not going to write down the splitting for this guy again. The only thing that is different is this time ordering minus sign which will be inherited. And as you probably imagine, it will be inherited by the commutator, anti-commutator too. Am I for them going too fast? But this is basically what you expect to have. In the bosonic case, all the not normal ordered guys, the only, the, all the good guys become normal order, so they get a subtract away. The only one you need to normal order will give you a comment. And the only difference in the phenomenal case is that uh, it gets an anti-commutator, and because it's a fermion, it gets the minus. Yeah. Shouldn't it be terribly surprising. So the only thing left to do is to figure out what is this commutator. To pick a minus of the psi. Ah. Well, I'm in Canadian citizens application. So I'm so excited about the hockey stick. But I still can't pass the bleach because I still can't remember the, that the famous guy that plays hockey. Every time Dan asked me, he got me. Every time. Oh, why did I change that one to be B? That's silly. You should like design this chalk to be that I just hold it in my hand and I can use mental power to control what the color is. So I don't have to run away running around to find it. Anyway, so we want a minus and a plus. We want to do the anti-commutator of this, right? We have done it before, remember? Remember that like a really stupid calculation I did that eventually turned to be zero? It's exactly this calculation. So I'll just point it to you. This anti-commutator will give you a bunch of things, cancel off the momentum integral. Even the like a two pi or whatever, they all cancel. And this guy, after the momentum integral, will give you the UU bar thing, which I didn't write down yet, but this, is another integral will keep turning into the e to the i p x minus one, x y, the thing that you are familiar with in the bosonic. Yeah, so you have e to the minus i p x. You have e to the plus i. Why? Aha! Uh -huh. That doesn't make things a little hard. Okay, so I'm just going to change all the x into y to make it more obvious why I don't need to do this commutator, anti-commutator again, and change p's to be q's. So now we can just directly stare at it. No, there's more p's. Right, I never complained this about, about this to you guys, but I'm sure my past, Students all know that I always complain about how in, 
sufficient to the either English or Greek letters. If you use Chinese characters to label any, everything, you'll never be able to uh, repeat them. You will always, <laughs> you will always got it right. <laughs> well, I also, I also try to teach them learn Chinese. I said, this is one, two, two, two. <laughs> I'm not lying to him. This is, this is one, this is two, this is three. And he was like, well, how do you guys write 10,000? I was like, <laughs> 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 okay, now let's stare at this, this, this thing. Okay, <laughs> let's stare at this thing. What I'm saying is, I'm just doing an anti commutator here. What uh, it does is to, I should label them R's and S. What it does is make this have the same polarization sum make the momentum, you can integrate over one momentum, then we only have P left, and then you can combine this guy's VE to the IPX plus IP1. And uh, then you have the spin sum has to vary about. But I have done that once already, so I'm not gonna done it, do it again. So I'll just write the result here. The spin sum is the other way. Same momentum, same, everything same, but they now we carry spinner index. And then the V guys throw. So this things actually carry A and B index. So is this guy. The only change is that it's a minus M. Okay. That's just a spinner and identity you are welcome to verify. You have use expression and you have a U dagger, you have a gamma zero, just multiply them out, you'll get this. It's, it's about two lines that I don't have. Okay, so I'll just write it down. What's this? So what is this is, I have that thing. Okay, at some point I should switch to the little note. Of e to the IP minus IP X minus Y to integral everything doesn't look right for some reason. I mean. And then I can do the other one too. No, apparently it's right. Yeah, it's right. Okay. Yeah. And then I need to do the other one. What's the other one? The other one is minus B minus A plus minus. The point is this thing has spinner in the Okay, so the other one, the only difference, as the argument uh, I said, is that the plus my m become minus m and this become ip y minus x instead of x minus So if I look at this and that, the CC commutator will do the same thing with the pencil integral, make the polarization index the same again, and the V 
thing will give us this, and the last two terms give us. Okay, what are we going to do about it? Well, remember the trick. The trick is to erase P and then replace it by, how can I get a P? I partial X. Because the, all the X dependence is on this exponential thing. So I can do that. And then for this, since x is the minus 1, so I should replace it by a minus i. Which is good. See minus and all minus. So I can just say minus can get in and change everything into a plus. Yeah. After this trick, these two terms can be united. So what this contraction, weak contraction, is like step function, x0, y0, this guy, plus step function, y0 minus x0, this guy. And then what I said is that I can pull this out because they are the same. And the rest of the thing is your bosonic propagate. Oh, I lost mu. Probably lost more mu. Okay, so yeah. We have our Feynman propagator. We have the LCC reduction formula. As the argue first half an hour of argument of, re, of reviewing, that means we get everything. The only thing left to do is tomorrow we actually calculate the amplitude with it. And then once we do that, we can finally compare to, and then we can finally stare at the amplitude and extract the Feynman.